Needle Stick Injury, Wikipedia Article Audio A needle stick injury, percutaneous injury, or percutaneous exposure incident or sharps injury is the penetration of the skin by a needle or other sharp object, which has been in contact with blood, tissue, or other body fluids before the exposure. Even though the acute physiological effects of a needle stick injury are generally negligible, these injuries can lead to transmission of blood-borne diseases, placing those exposed at increased risk of contracting infectious diseases, such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and the human immunodeficiency virus. Among healthcare workers and laboratory personnel worldwide, more than 25 blood-borne viruses have been reported to be caused by needle stick injuries. In addition to needle stick injuries transmission of these viruses can also occur as a result of contamination of the mucous membranes, such as these of the eyes, with blood, or body fluids but needle stick injuries make up more than 80% of all percutaneous exposure incidents in the United States. Various other occupations are also at increased risk of needle stick injury, including law enforcement, laborers, tattoo artists, food preparers, and agricultural workers. Cause Epidemiology Consequences of needle stick injuries Psychological effects Post-exposure prophylaxis Hepatitis B Hepatitis C HIV Prevention Cost Legislation Needle stick injuries outside healthcare Needle exchange programs Increasing recognition of the unique occupational hazard posed by needle stick injuries as well as the development of efficacious interventions to minimize the largely preventable occupational risk, encouraged legislative regulation in the U.S., causing a decline in needle stick injuries among healthcare workers. Needle stick injuries are a common event in the healthcare environment. When drawing blood, administering an intramuscular or intravenous drug, or performing any procedure involving sharps, accidents can occur and facilitate the transmission of blood-borne diseases. Injuries also commonly occur during needle recapping or via improper disposal of devices into an overfilled or poorly located sharps container. Lack of access to appropriate personal protective equipment, or alternatively, employee failure to use provided equipment, increases the risk of occupational needle stick injuries. Needle stick injuries may also occur when needles are exchanged between personnel, loaded into a needle driver, or when sutures are tied off while still connected to the needle. Needle stick injuries are more common during night shifts and for less experienced people, Fatigue, high workload, shift work, high pressure, or high perception of risk can all increase the chances of a needle stick injury. During surgery, a surgical needle or other sharp instrument may inadvertently penetrate the glove and skin of operating room personnel. Scalpel injuries tend to be larger than a needle stick. Generally, needle stick injuries cause only minor visible trauma or bleeding. However, even in the absence of bleeding the risk of viral infection remains. In 2007, the World Health Organization estimated annual global needle stick injuries at 2 million per year, and another investigation estimated 3.5 million injuries yearly. The European Biosafety Network estimated 1 million needle stick injuries annually in Europe. The U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration estimates 5.6 million workers in the healthcare industry are at risk of occupational exposure to blood-borne diseases via percutaneous injury. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates more than 600,000 needle stick injuries occur among healthcare workers in the U.S. annually.
it is difficult to establish correct figures for the risk of exposure or the incidence of needle stick injuries. First of all it is difficult to observe a needle stick injury, either in oneself or in other persons. Glove perforations in surgeons are considered a reasonable proxy that can be measured objectively. Even though glove perforations can be objectively measured, it is still unclear what the relation is between glove perforations and needle stick injuries. Another problem is under-reporting of needle stick injuries. It is estimated that half of all occupational needle stick injuries are not reported. Additionally, an unknown number of occupational needle stick injuries are reported by the affected employee, yet due to organizational failure, institutional record of the injury does not exist. This makes it difficult to determine what the exact risk of exposure is for various medical occupations. Most studies use databases of reported needle stick injuries to determine preventable causes. However this is different from establishing an exposure risk. Among healthcare workers, nurses and physicians appear especially at risk, those who work in an operating room environment are at the highest risk. An investigation among American surgeons indicates that almost every surgeon experienced at least one such injury during their training. More than half of needle stick injuries that occur during surgery happen while surgeons are sewing the muscle or fascia. Within the medical field, specialties differ in regard to the risk of needle stick injury, surgery, anesthesia, otorhinolaryngology, internal medicine, and dermatology have high risk, whereas radiology and pediatrics have relatively low rates of injury. In the United States, approximately half of all needle stick injuries affecting health care workers are not reported, citing the long reporting process and its interference with work as their reason for not reporting an incident. The availability of hotlines, witnesses, and response teams can increase the percentage of reports. Physicians are particularly likely to leave a needle stick unreported, citing worries about loss of respect or a low-risk perception. Low-risk perception can be caused by poor knowledge about risk, or an incorrect estimate of a particular patient's risk. Surveillance systems to track needle stick injuries include the National Surveillance System for Healthcare Workers, a voluntary system in the northeastern United States, and the Exposure Prevention Information Network, a recording and tracking system that also gathers data. While needle stick injuries have the potential to transmit bacteria, protozoa, viruses, and prions, the risk of contracting hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV is the highest. The World Health Organization estimated that in 2000, 66,000 hepatitis B, 16,000 hepatitis C, and 1,000 HIV infections were caused by needle stick injuries. In places with higher rates of blood-borne diseases in the general population, Healthcare workers are more susceptible to contracting these diseases from a needle stick injury. Hepatitis B carries the greatest risk of transmission, with 10% of exposed workers eventually showing seroconversion and 10% having symptoms. Higher rates of hepatitis B vaccination among the general public and healthcare workers have reduced the risk of transmission. Non-healthcare workers still have a lower HBV vaccination rate and therefore a higher risk. The hepatitis C transmission rate has been reported at 1.8%, but newer, larger surveys have shown only a 0.5% transmission rate. The overall risk of HIV infection after percutaneous exposure to HIV-infected material in the healthcare setting is 0.3%. Individualized risk of blood-borne infection from a used biomedical sharp is further dependent upon additional factors. Injuries with a hollow-bore needle, deep penetration, visible blood on the needle, 
a needle located in a deep artery or vein, or a biomedical device contaminated with blood from a terminally ill patient increase the risk for contracting a blood-borne infection. The psychological effects of occupational needle stick injuries can include health anxiety, anxiety about disclosure or transmission to a sexual partner, trauma-related emotions, and depression. These effects can cause self-destructive behavior or functional impairment in relationships and daily life. This is not mitigated by knowledge about disease transmission or PEP. Though some affected people have worsened anxiety during repeated testing, anxiety and other psychological effects typically abate after testing is complete. A minority of people affected by needle stick injuries may have lasting psychological effects, including post-traumatic stress disorder. After a needle stick injury, certain procedures can minimize the risk of infection. Lab tests of the recipient should be obtained for baseline studies, including HIV, acute hepatitis panel and for immunized individuals, HB surface antibody. Unless already known, the infectious status of the source needs to be determined. Unless the source is known to be negative for HBV, HCV, and HIV, post-exposure prophylaxis should be initiated ideally within one hour of the injury. After exposure to the hepatitis B virus, appropriate and timely prophylaxis can prevent infection and subsequent development of chronic infection or liver disease. The mainstay of PEP is the hepatitis B vaccine. In certain circumstances, hepatitis B immunoglobulin is recommended for added protection. Immunoglobulin and antivirals are not recommended for hepatitis C PEP. There is no vaccine for HCV, therefore, post-exposure treatment consists of monitoring for seroconversion. There is limited evidence for the use of antivirals in acute hepatitis C infection. If the status of the source patient is unknown, their blood should be tested for HIV as soon as possible following exposure. The injured person can start antiretroviral drugs for PEP as soon as possible, preferably within three days of exposure. There is no vaccine for HIV. When the source of blood is known to be HIV positive, a three-drug regimen is recommended by the CDC. Those exposed to blood with a low viral load or otherwise low risk can use a two-drug protocol. The antivirals are taken for four weeks and can include nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, or fusion inhibitors. All of these drugs can have severe side effects. PEP may be discontinued if the source of blood tests HIV negative. Follow-up of all exposed individuals includes counseling and HIV testing for at least six months after exposure. Such tests are done at baseline, six weeks, 12 weeks, and six months and longer in specific circumstances, such as CO infection with HCV. The prevention of needle stick injuries should focus on those healthcare workers that are most at risk. The group most at risk are surgeons and surgical staff in the operating room who sustain injuries from suture needles and other sharps used in operations. There are basically three complementary approaches to prevention of these sharps injuries. The first one is the use of tools that have been changed so that they are less likely to lead to a sharps injury such as blunt or taper point surgery needles and safety engineered scalpels. The second is to start using safe working practices such as the hands-free technique. The third line of prevention is increased personal protective equipment such as the use of two pairs of gloves. In addition to these preventive approaches implementation measures are necessary because the measures are not universally taken up.
To achieve better implementation, legislation, education, and training are necessary among all healthcare workers at risk. Another large group at risk are nurses but their frequency of exposure is much less than in surgeons. Their main risk comes from the use and disposal of injection syringes. The same prevention approaches can be implemented here. There are many so-called safety engineered devices such as retractable needles, needle shields slash sheaths, needle less four kits, and blunt or valved ends on four connectors. The use of extra gloves is less common among nurses. Some studies have found that safer needles attached to syringes reduce injuries, but others have shown mixed results or no benefit. The adherence to no-touch protocols that eliminate direct contact with needles during use and disposal greatly reduces the risk of needle stick injuries. In the surgical setting, especially in abdominal operations, Blunt tip suture needles were found to reduce needle stick injuries by 69%. Blunt tip or tapered tip suture needles can be used to sew muscle and fascia. Though they are more expensive than sharp tipped needles, this cost is balanced by the reduction in injuries, which are expensive to treat. Sharp tipped needles cause 51 to 77% of surgical needle stick injuries. The American College of Surgeons and the Food and Drug Administration have endorsed the adoption of blunt tip suture needles for suturing fascia and muscle. Hollowbore needles pose a greater risk of injury than solid needles, but hollowbore needle injuries are highly preventable. 25% of hollowbore needle injuries to healthcare professionals can be prevented by using safer needles. Gloves can also provide better protection against injuries from tapered tip as opposed to sharp tipped needles. In addition, the use of two pairs of gloves can have the risk of needle stick injury in surgical staff. Triple gloving may be more effective than double gloving, but using thicker gloves does not make a difference. A 2014 Cochrane Review, updated in 2017, found low-quality evidence showing that safety devices on four start kits and venipuncture equipment reduce the frequency of needle stick injuries. However, these safety systems can increase the risk of exposure to splashed blood. Education with training for at-risk healthcare workers can reduce their risk of needle stick injuries. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health is a campaign to educate at-risk health care workers. There are indirect and direct costs associated with needle stick injuries. The U.S. Government Accountability Office determined that requiring hospitals to use safety-engineered needles would result in substantial savings due to the reduction in needle stick injuries requiring treatment. Costs of needle stick injuries include prophylaxis, wages, and time lost by workers, quality of life, emotional distress, costs associated with drug toxicity, organizational liability, mortality, quality of patient care, and workforce reduction. Testing and follow-up treatment for healthcare workers who experienced a needle stick injury was estimated at $5,000 in the year 2000, depending upon the medical treatment provided. The American Hospital Association found that a case of infection by blood-borne pathogens could cost $1 million for testing, follow-up, and disability payments. An estimated $1 billion annually is saved by preventing needle stick injuries among healthcare workers in the U.S., including fees associated with testing, laboratory work, counseling, and follow up costs. In the United States, the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act of 2000 and the subsequent Bloodborne Pathogens Standard of 2001 require safer needle devices, employee input, and records of all sharps injuries in healthcare settings. In the U.S., 
non-surgical needle stick injuries decreased by 31.6% in the five years following the passage of the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. However, this legislation did not affect surgical settings, where injuries increased 6.5% in the same period. The Coalition for Safe Community Needle Disposal estimates there are over 7.5 billion syringes used for home medical care in the United States. This large amount of home medical syringes has added to the problem of non-healthcare related needle stick injuries due to mishandling and improper disposal of the syringes. Blood on any sharp instrument may be infectious, whether or not the blood is fresh. HIV and Hepatitis C virus are only viable for hours after blood has dried, but Hepatitis B virus is stable even when dried. The risk of Hepatitis B transmission in the community is also increased due to the higher prevalence of HBV in the population than HIV and the high concentration of the virus in the blood. Many professions are at risk of needle stick injury including law enforcement, waste collectors, laborers, and agricultural workers. There is no standard system for collecting and tracking needle stick injuries in the community, which makes it difficult to measure the full impact of this problem. Law enforcement workers, like healthcare workers, underreport needle stick injuries. In San Diego, 30% of police reported needle sticks. A study of 1,333 police officers in the Denver Police Department found that only 43.4% reported a needle stick injury they received, 42% of which occurred during their evening shift. Most of the needle stick injuries experienced by these workers occurred in their first five years of employment. In New York City, a study found a rate of 38.7 exposures per 10,000 police officers. Needle stick injuries are among the top three injuries that occur among material recovery facility workers who sort through trash to remove recyclable items from the community collected garbage. Housekeeping and janitorial workers in public sites, including hotels, airports, indoor and outdoor recreational venues, theaters, retail stores, and schools are at daily risk of exposure to contaminated syringes. Needle stick injuries that occur in children from discarded needles in community settings, such as parks and playgrounds, are especially concerning. Not only for families but also for the entire community. While the exact number of needle stick injuries in children in the U.S. is unknown, even one injury in a child is enough to cause public alarm. Studies in Canada have reported 274 injuries from needle sticks in children with the majority being boys and occurring from needles discarded in streets and slash or parks. There are a number of ways in which needle stick injuries could be prevented. First and foremost, increased education in the community is vital. It is especially important to educate kids while they are young. Studies of injuries from discarded needles have reported that the average age of children injured is between 5 and 8 years. In one study, 15% of injuries occurred in children pretending to use drugs. Therefore, Children should be taught at a young age about the risks of handling needles and the correct actions to take if they find a syringe. More outreach programs for addiction treatment and infection prevention programs for injection drug users would be very beneficial. Public needle disposal and syringe service programs or needle exchange programs have also proven to reduce the number of needles discarded in public areas. According to the CDC, these programs are effective in the prevention of HIV and they help reduce the risk of infection with hepatitis C virus. Additionally, in 2004, the Environmental Protection Agency came up with a number program options for safe disposal including
in the event that needle stick prevention programs are not put in place in a given community, a 1994 study suggests an alternative for high-risk areas. The study proposed the implementation of a vaccination effort to give children a routine prophylaxis against hepatitis B to prevent the development of the illness in the event that a child encounters an improperly disposed needle. Needle exchange programs were first established in 1981 in Amsterdam as a response from the injecting drug community to an influx of hepatitis B spurred to urgency by the introduction of HIV-AIDS. Needle syringe programs quickly became an integral component of public health across the developed world. These programs function by providing facilities in which people who use injecting drugs can receive sterile syringes and injection equipment. Preventing the transmission of blood-borne disease requires sterile syringes and injection equipment for each unique injection, which is necessarily predicated upon access and availability of these materials at no cost for those using them. Needle exchange programs are an effective way of decreasing the risk associated with needle stick injuries. These programs remove contaminate syringes from the street, reducing the risk of inadvertent transmission of blood-borne infections to the surrounding community and to law enforcement. A study in Hartford, Connecticut found that needle stick injury rates among Hartford police officers decreased after the introduction of a needle exchange program, six injuries and 1,007 drug-related arrests for the six-month period before versus two in 1,032 arrests for the six-month period after. Data almost universally confirm the value of needle exchange programs which substantially decrease the risk of HIV among injectable drug users, and do not carry unintended negative consequences. U.S. states that publicly fund exchange programs are associated with reduced rates of HIV transmission, increased availability of sterile syringes among injecting drug users, and increased provision of health and social services to users. States that do not fund needle exchange programs are associated with increased rates of HIV-AIDS. Nevertheless, the U.S. government has explicitly prohibited federal funding for needle exchange programs since 1988, as part of the zero-tolerance drug policy in that country. Needle exchange programs have therefore been sparsely implemented in the United States, where harm reduction is still criminalized. Drop-off collection sites, syringe exchange programs, mail-back programs, home needle destruction devices, household hazardous waste collection sites, residential waste special pickup programs.